Welcome to surgery, ladies and gentlemen. Now we're gonna be kicking it off with preoperative evaluation. Now before a patient can actually have surgery, you gotta make sure it's safe for them to have surgery. Emergent surgery doesn't necessarily always have a preoperative evaluation. The patient's gonna die from bleeding out. It really doesn't matter if they were smoking a cigarette before they came in. However, in elective procedures, an elective gallbladder removal, an elective appendectomy, in patients who are having any kind of procedure in which it's a controlled environment and that the risks outweigh the benefits unless they're optimized, this is when preoperative evaluation makes the most amount of sense. Now on your exam, what's gonna end up happening is you're gonna ask you questions about three major areas of risk assessment. The first is cardiac assessment. The second is gonna be pulmonary assessment. And the last is renal assessment. So remember, one heart, two lungs, two kidneys. All five together, you can say bye-bye. Remember, there are three organs you need to live, brain, heart, and kidneys. If you're a guy, you might need one more, but that's about it. So remember, in this case, we're gonna be talking first off about preoperative assessment for your heart. Now let's talk about what we got going on. First of all, if your ejection fraction, that is right, it's the amount of blood that your heart is putting out with each pump, is less than 35%. Ladies and gentlemen, if you see this on your exam, you're gonna go ahead and answer that an EF less than 35% is associated with a what? Increased cardiac risk. An increased cardiac risk. These patients inherently will undergo a great deal of stress. The catecholamine surge your body is gonna feel the minute the skin is cut or the catheter is introduced is gonna put a great deal of strain and stress upon the heart and the patient themselves could have perioperative mortality. Therefore, we do not wanna deal with patients who have an EF less than 35%. They need to be optimized. Now, how do you optimize them? Well, there's medical management. There's reperfusion management. That's right, if a patient has a large honking mass in the right colon and their heart is only pumping at 20 beats per minute, you gotta fix that heart first. If you need to do a cath, do the cath. If you gotta do bypass, do the bypass. You do what's necessary to reestablish perfusion for the coronaries. Reestablishing perfusion allows for myocytes to contract. You increase your contractility, therefore you increase your cardiac output. You increase your cardiac output, and what ends up happening? Everybody's getting perfused. And what is the end of the game, ladies and gentlemen? Perfusion, perfusion, perfusion. Now, the next thing to consider about the heart. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, your heart loves so many things. It loves blood. It does, it loves blood. But if you have an MI, yes, ladies and gentlemen, if you've had an MI, so if you have a patient on the wards and the patient comes in and they says, listen, I wanna have a surgery done for X, Y, and Z. But they tell you that, you know what? In my medical history, six months ago or less, they had an MI you tell them you're gonna wait. So you're gonna defer for at least six months after a myocardial infarction. You wait, you simply wait for six months. The reason for that is because the risk, again, of perioperative mortality is high. Why is that? Well, you know those anesthesiologists who try to ruin your case? Well, this patient has this problem, this patient has that problem, I don't know what's happening here, we can't do this case, canceled. They're doing that not because they don't care. They're doing that not because they're bored or they want to get back on Netflix and watch the third season of House of Cards. No, they're doing this simply because they know the patient's risk is too high. And so if a patient tells the anesthesiologist, well, I had an MI last month, but I'm here for my breast augmentation, he's gonna say, no, you're not. You're gonna wait another five months because when I give you anesthesia, whether it's general or propofol, I'm gonna drop your blood pressure. When I drop your blood pressure, your diastolic filling time is gonna decrease and your diastolic perfusions are gonna do this. And when do your coronaries fill? During diastole. And when they fill during diastole, they're supposed to feed your myocytes. But if your pressures are already low, your diastolic filling is gonna be low. And then you're not gonna perfuse your heart. And then what are you gonna have? <gasps> Another myocardial infarction. Plus, if a patient's had an MI, how do you know they've been reperfused? How do you know medically optimized? How do you know any of these things have been done? I just had an MI. Mm -hmm. Ladies and gentlemen, those of you sitting in the audience watching this course right now for your exam that's coming up, for you, in your time period, an MI is like, mm, it happened, big deal, ah, I'm done, okay, good, go home, take some medicine, you'll feel better. 35, 40 years ago, a myocardial infarction was lethal. Just because we've gotten better at treating it, doesn't mean that we need to take it lightly. So remember, any patient who's had a myocardial infarction, you had defer surgery for at least six months. Now, last bit of the heart. CHF, well, 
We mentioned it here, if your EF is less than 35%, they need to be reperfused because they have increased cardiac risk for perioperative mortality. Increased cardiac risk for perioperative mortality. What if their CHF is uncontrolled? Completely uncontrolled. What if they have JVD? Oh my God. What if they have lower extremity edema? Oh my God, oh my God. What if they have an S3 heart sound? What if they have rails on exam? What does this tell you? JVD, lower extremity edema, S3 heart sound, rails on exam, and this tells you their congestive heart failure is out of control. That's right, they're an uncontrolled CHF. They're not medically optimized, and what are you gonna do for them? Well, if you remember from your cardiology chapter with Dr. Fisher, what you will remember is that the three medications that are gonna get them uh, tuned up are what? Well, first off, you're gonna start with a beta blocker, that's right, you're gonna decrease contract uh, contraction times, you're going to actually allow the heart to fill more, perfuse more, and therefore take advantage of Frank Starling curves. Mm-hmm, that's right. Even applies to surgeons. I know surgeons don't think. It does. It happens right here. Look, you're seeing it. Next, you're also going to go ahead and start an ACE and an ARB because ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers, what do they do? They reduce preload, they reduce afterload. Ladies and gentlemen, reducing preload and reducing afterload is like 85% of a cardiology fellowship. That's really all you need to do. There's nothing much more to it than that. And lastly, right here, ladies and gentlemen, in addition to giving them a beta blocker, in addition to giving them a beta blocker and an ACE inhibitor, in addition to giving them a beta blocker and an ACE inhibitor or an ARB, why do you give them an ARB over an ACE inhibitor? Because they're coughing. <coughs> they're coughing. <coughs> and so you're going to take them off the ACE inhibitor, put them on an ARB. If they can't tolerate either one, what are you going to use? You're going to use hydralazine and nitrates. You're going to use hydralazine and nitrates. You're going to use hydralazine and nitrates. And the last medication you're going to do that was noted on the RAILS trial for CHF class 3 and 4, you're going to put them on spironolactone. That's right. We're going to use a little spironolactone. Now, those three medications will optimize their CHF. You also remember that spironolactone is going to give them gynecomastia. If that happens and the guy is worried about it, you tell them, okay, you're going to take a plerinone instead. Two medications on this list are also going to give you some side effects. Let's talk side effects right here. ACE inhibitors and ARBs and spironolactone, both of these are going to give you a lot of potassium increase. Your potassium is going to increase and so therefore, keep in mind, you got to watch your potassium. However, a lot of patients with uncontrolled CHF are also on diuretics and the Lasix will cause them to become hypokalemic. So what you hope for is the hyperkalemia balances out with the hypokalemia. But the point here is this, these three medications Beta blocker, ACE or ARB, spironolactone, reduce mortality, optimize CHF, reduce the JVD, resorb the lower extremity edema, try to reduce the S3 heart sound, clear up the lungs, so what can the patient do? <sighs> they want to breathe. Oh Lord, do they ever want to breathe. Now, we need to get to our next section, which is going to be pulmonary, pulmonary and renal, pulmonary and renal.